Okay, we're ready to look now at uh, story number five. And I'm going to be moving just a, hopefully a little bit faster so that we can take time for some questions. Story number five. The Holy Spirit will push everyone into conviction or defiance during the 1260 days of the two witnesses. Okay. Here is day one. Here is the earthquake. I use that jagged line to represent the earth breaking up. And this is a time period of 1260 days. During this time period, the Holy Spirit is going to, to do something like you have never seen in your life. And if it weren't in the Bible, it would be unimaginable. Okay, notice how this works. God is going to pummel the earth with his four judgments to silence the world. Okay? So, when, when, in order to hear the Holy Spirit, things really need to quiet down. In fact, the Spirit's voice is often called the still small voice, is it not? So, in order to hear the still small voice, God has to put silence on the earth. He's going to shut down all of the noise, and then, instead of being the still small voice, it's going to be the really big voice. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out upon all flesh. Powerfully. And the, the contest is going to be as intense as it was on that Friday morning when Pilate wrestled with what to do with Jesus. Have you ever studied the struggle that Pilate went through? Have you, have you understood that he is in the middle of this very conflicting thing? And he recognizes that in this man that he's talking to, this is not a criminal. He knows he's no ordinary person. Pilate was aware of the messianic promise. And then comes this little agonizing letter from his wife have nothing to do with this man I have been troubled greatly by him now Pilate is in a very difficult position and he tries the political way out he goes over and washes his hands and says I have nothing to do with this guess what <laughs> But you know something? Legend has it, and in some literature, they defend it, that after Pilate, after Jesus ascended to heaven, Pilate lost his job, and he escaped to Ethiopia, where among Christians, Pilate became respected and um, eventually uh, exonerated as a disciple of Jesus. And in fact, in Ethiopia today, there is a um, uh, religious order in the, in the Catholic or Ethiopian ver version of the Catholic faith, which is called the Order of Pilate. Isn't that interesting? I don't know whether it's true or not, but it would, it would be wonderful if Pilate did receive the Lord, having had his moment of truth with him. Of course, it was necessary that Jesus would die, but Pilate, he was very troubled 
and he was put in a very difficult position. The reason that I want you to understand this is that every heart, every survivor, every person alive during this time is going to be pushed into a position of conviction or defiance. We will either succumb to the, to the Lord and, the, and the, through the Spirit and through his uh, convicting power, or we will harden our hearts as did Pharaoh. You see the contrast? That's what happens during the time period of the two witnesses, the 1260 days. Let's look at the unpardonable sin for a moment. Jesus said, and so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And let me just interject here. There's a reason why this is the way it is. Because you see, get this. Remember the little man I drew who has the two chambers? Or actually he has the evil heart. Remember the, the bad heart? The only way, the only way our hearts can be changed is through the power of the Spirit, the miracle of the Spirit. The rebirth can only happen through the Spirit. John chapter 3. You can't make yourself to be born again. You can't will it. You can't buy it. You can't manufacture it. You can't steal it. You can't get it any other way except through a miracle. And that's why sinning against the Spirit becomes unforgivable. Because if you shut the Spirit out, if He can't get any further than that, if He can't change your heart, you can't connect to God. We only connect to God through the Spirit. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. And anyone, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. A lot of people look at the word speaks here and thinks it means to voice. That's not what it means. To blaspheme against the Spirit means to insult. Blasphemy means to insult. And so how do we insult the Holy Spirit? I'll show you. The Holy Spirit comes and he brings guilt. And he says to Larry, Larry, what you just did is wrong. You need to make it right. Guilt, you know what guilt feels like? Bad. <laughs> it feels bad. Your soul is upset. You're disturbed. You're not at ease. Something's wrong. And the Spirit is doing this. He brings guilt because He wants you to make it right and do what is right. And so when we say by our actions, no, I'm not going to do, I don't care what is right. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to shut out the guilt and ignore it. I'm going to fill my life with everything else so that I don't have these bad feelings. And this is why, this is why so many people are using drugs to hide from guilt. They want to feel okay by running from the Spirit. They're insulting the Spirit, and their actions are speaking against the Spirit. That's what it means. Jesus said, if we insult the Spirit, and if we turn our backs upon the Spirit, that sin will not be forgiven, either in this age, or even through all eternity to come. How amazing is that? So, during the time of the 
144,000 testifying during the time of the Great Tribulation here. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. We call that in some, in some uh, language the latter rain. We talk about the Holy Spirit being poured out in great abundance. And the purpose of the latter rain is to bring the crop, you know, to maturity. And so there's the little flower that finally blooms and is sealed. So God is going to do everything possible to save the maximum number of people. And the Holy Spirit is going to push everyone into conviction or defiance. That's story number five. Story number six. And you thought the end would never come. <laughs> Lucifer will be physically, will be permitted to physically appear for several reasons. Um, I could spend a long time talking about the physical appearing of the devil. He is the great antichrist that will appear. And it is my understanding that he will appear around the 890th day, 891st day of the great tribulation. So if you are doing a little math in your head, if this is day one, you can see that 890 days later is about a year and two years and three months later, approximately. And why does God allow the devil to physically appear? This is a profound study. It has enormous, enormous consequences. The world has never seen anything like it. And even worse, the world knows nothing about it. Let me just sort of give you a quick summary about it. One day, the 144,000 are going to be preaching and, and, and proclaiming the gospel. And then pretty soon, most everybody who is going to respond to the Holy Spirit will have responded. And most everybody who has decided to be defiant will be defiant. So by the time we get here, most of the world has decided where they want to be. Okay? And, and there's a large number of people who have chosen to be on the wrong side of the fence. And so these are people, let, let's, let's represent these people as defiant. Because they just haven't had enough evidence that they really should change their way of thinking. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You know, we're just hard-headed like Pharaoh. Okay? So when the Lord releases the devil, the devil is going to come down out of the sky. He's going to be attended by millions of angels. The world will think, whoa, this must be the second coming. That's what, that's what it will look like. And to, and to the people who are uninformed and who have shut out the testimony of the 144,000, they're going to be blown away. They're going to be blown away because, A, they've never seen a 15-foot being before. If the angels in Solomon's temple, which God had him create and gave him the plans to make, if the angels in the most holy place were 15 feet tall, I think that must be life size. I think the angels are about 15 feet tall. And of course, the angels in Solomon's temple each had a 30 foot wingspan. So the two angels, their wings outstretched, reached the 60 foot width 
of the most holy place. And when you take, what do you say to someone 15 feet tall? Yes, sir. <laughs> 15 feet, that's about, that's about to where the ceiling is. Think of, think of three, I'm, I'm a little over six feet. Think three of me standing on shoulder, you know, on head to head. You'd be close. What do you say to a marvelous, glorious, brilliant being who can do any miracle on demand that's 15 feet tall? And worse, he's got 200 million friends with him that are just as big. Do you understand? It's, it's sort of like being in Kobani right now. If you've been following the news, you know there's a little town in Iran right on the Syrian border called Kobani. And the Kurds there have been fighting, 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 and they are grossly outnumbered by the uh, ISIS militants that are trying to take the city. And ISIS has all kinds of heavy artillery. ISIS has all kinds of reinforcements. ISIS has uh, new people to come in and to pick up because the others are battle weary or injured. And so ISIS has unlimited resources to throw at Kobani. But there's a little handful of Kurds who are dug in and they're fighting and they know it. They're fighting to their death. They will not give up. <laughs> wow. When the, le when the devil and his angels appear, they will be so overwhelming in their size and in the numbers that it will take the steam and the starch out of every heart. How do you overcome this? God permits Lucifer to physically appear to show the world that there are higher authorities than man. Man is slightly above the ants in the food chain. <laughs> man is just little. And when we see the size, fallen man is really little. But when we see the size of these angels, whoa, it will just take, it will just be overwhelming. And Lucifer comes masquerading as God, pretending to be God, and he claims to be God, and he will do everything possible to deceive the world into believing that he is God. He will feed the hungry. You remember how Jesus took a few loaves and fishes and fed the 5,000? Lucifer will do the same thing because global famine will be everywhere. And when he has people literally eating out of his hand, oh, here's a free meal, here's food. And he takes a few fishes and a few loaves, somehow makes them feed 5,000. God is among us. And so the devil is going to put on, as Ed Sullivan used to say, a really big show. <laughs> you have to be 92 to appreciate that. That was that long ago, right? <laughs> but God is releasing Lucifer upon the world basically to polarize the world. And here's what I mean. When the devil physically appears, this group of people will recognize that this is the devil because this group of people have read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation clearly predicts the physical arrival and appearing of Lucifer. 
And in Revelation 13, he's described as an imposter of the lamb. We call him the lamb-like beast. You see, the lamb in Revelation 5 is Christ, the lamb that was slain. And the lamb in Revelation 13, the lamb-like, is an imposter of Christ. And so when Lucifer arrives, the saints will know who he is. Those who have been sealed will not have any doubt in their mind as to what this is all about. The timing will be right. Remember, this is fifth trumpet. They will know that the, the 144,000 will have alerted everyone. The testimony of Jesus will have been heard. And at this point, the third angel's message will be proclaimed. If anyone worships this beast and receives his mark, the same is going to be tortured by, by God with fire and brimstone. So the saints will know that it's the devil. Now, there's another group of people that I call the religious wicked. What do I mean by that? What are religious wicked people? There are three groups of people on earth at any given time. There are the saints, there are the religious wicked, and there are the non-religious wicked. Non-religious wicked. The religious wicked are people like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. What, when, when truth came to them, when Christ stood before them, what kind of hearts did they have? Evil hearts. The truth was heard. The truth spoke to them. The truth was given to them, but they rejected it because their hearts were evil. They were religious. Oh yeah, they were religious to the T but they were evil. That's why I call them religious wicked. And in every religious body of people on earth, there are these people, religious wicked. Their religion is their God, and they want no th nothing to do with truth. And Jesus said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men refuse to see the light because their deeds were evil. They don't want to know the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They want to support. They want to sustain. They want to maintain what they have control of. And that's what makes them religious wicked. And then there's the third group of people called the non-religious. And let's say a lot of non-religious people have good hearts. A lot of non-religious people have evil hearts. When Satan comes, God's, his, God gives him this job. His job is to eliminate this third group of people. So that by the time we get over here to the seventh trumpet, there's only two groups of people. Those worshiping the devil, the lamb-like, and those worshiping Jesus, the lamb. So when the devil gets here in the fifth trumpet, he's going to eliminate, and this really shocks people, but it's true, the devil is going to eliminate all the religions of the world. He has to. How can there be religious diversity when God lives among men? That won't work. When God is here, how can there be one faith and another faith? <laughs> In fact, when there, God is here, there's no need for faith <laughs> at all. Whatever God says is God's will. Take it and run. It's over. And so Catholicism is going to disappear. Hinduism is going to disappear. Outlawed. Islam is going to be abolished, 
Protestantism abolished. God is going to give the devil the power to oppose and to eliminate all the religions of the world. So that there is one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's how he polarizes the world. He separates the saints. When, look, when there are no churches, when, when belonging, let's say you are a Catholic, and if you suddenly learn that it's punishable offense to be a Catholic, how long are you going to remain a Catholic? Let's say you're a Muslim, and it becomes a punishable offense to remain a Muslim. And you say, well, I'm not giving up on Allah. Well, Allah's here. And he says that there's no further Islamic faith. What do you do? You see, a lot of people can't leave their religious heritage behind because that's all they have. And, but God is going to strip away the religious heritage of all the people of earth so that people can simply make a choice about truth or error. Lucifer's lies are the truth spoken by Jesus through the lips of his prophets. Lucifer is also going to be permitted to physically appear in order to destroy the world. He's going to cause the people of earth to bring about the most awful destruction. This is why in Hebrew and in Greek his name means the destroyer. Abaddon and Apollyon. And God releases the devil to show the world and the universe what the sinful nature will do given enough time and authority. See, there's a little bit of devil in all of us. <laughs> and if you had the kind of power and if, you, and if the carnal heart is given enough time and power and resources we all become a mirror of Lucifer if we are ruled by the sinful nature. So there are several levels of meaning that go on with the physical appearing of Satan. But let me just bring this short story to a close in order to show you uh, this. Speaking about the devil when he physically appears, notice what the scripture says. 2 Thessalonians 2.4, he will oppose, oppose, what does that word mean to you? Opposition, right? He will be in opposition and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Do you see why I just said that he's going to abolish the religions of the world? When he comes, he's not going to belong to any church. He's not going to be the representative of any church. He's not going to be Jewish. He's not going to be Muslim. He's not going to be Catholic. He's not going to be Protestant. He's opposed to all of them. That's what the scripture says. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. The devil will masquerade as God. Notice why the Lord releases him. At a point in time, the lawless one will be revealed. The devil is called the lawless one because when he physically appears, he will not abide by any man-made laws. Zero. What you own will be his. He, 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 nothing, nothing that man has created will he have respect for. This is why he's called the lawless one. The lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow at the second coming. But notice this, the coming of the lawless one will look like one thing, but it will actually be something else. It will look like the second coming of Christ, but it will be the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. 
So the devil is going to perform signs, miracles, wonders of all kinds. And why? What's, he want? What's the purpose? So he can deceive those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. You get the picture? What is the reason that God sends the powerful delusion? They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Wow. So, I want to close story number six with the idea that God is going to allow the devil to physically appear. He's got several things he wants uh, done. Lucifer wants to do them. And so he's going to give Lucifer the authority to do them. And the devil is going to abolish all religions and all governments. And he's going to set up his one world government, a theocracy, where he rules over the world as king of kings and lord of lords. Now we come to story number seven. Lucifer will force, one way or the other, everyone into submission except those who put their faith in Christ. I want to talk now for a few moments about the mark of the beast and then I'll take your questions. Here we are today. Here's our timeline. Here is day one. Here's 1260 days. And here is the fifth trumpet. And here is the sixth trumpet. And it's this, it's this time period right here that we're going to be talking about. Right here. This is where the mark of the beast will be implemented. Okay? In the sixth trumpet. And to make sense of this very quickly, let me just jump to Revelation 9 and ha ask you a question. When the sixth angel sounds his trumpet and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour, day, month, and year are released, they're going to kill what? A third of mankind. All right. This is right here. This is where one third of mankind will be destroyed. Got it? Okay. If we kill one third, that leaves us with two thirds of mankind. Right? Now tell me, what is the decimal equivalent of two thirds? Point six six six. Is that right? Yes. Mathematically true? Yes. yes. Now, let's suppose, and there's scriptural support for this, but I don't have time to go through it. Just please take this with a grain of salt. Just consider it. When the devil gets ready to take on and kill a third of mankind, here's, here's how he will go about it. I need a new piece of paper. <clears throat> Before he kills a third of mankind, this is what he will do, according to Larry. Okay? He's going to divide the people of earth into groups of a thousand. Just like Moses did, just like King David did, just like Solomon did. This, was, this has been done all through Bible history. People are divided into small groups for logistical purposes, manageable purposes. And then captains are set up over hundreds. You know how, you know, 
the, you know how it all works, a chain of command, captains over 50s and then captains over 10s. You know how Jethro told Moses to do it, and set it all up in the wilderness. Okay, the devil's going to do the same thing. Because when you don't have radio and electricity and tra transportation and all the things we depend on today, this is the logistical way it has to be done to manage large numbers of people. The devil is going to, de to, to divide the people of earth for logistical necessities to receive rations because food and water and whatever necessities of life are available will be apportioned to each group of a thousand to be fair. The devil wants to appear to be fair, of course. Okay. From each group of a thousand, the Lord is going to take one man or one woman and he's going to appoint them as the commander of the group. Just like Moses, just like David, just like Solomon. And so that leaves 999 people. Right? Well, if you have 999 and you kill a third, how many people does that leave living? Six hundred sixty-six, right? Now, here's the wicked part of the whole story. While the thousand people are living, Lucifer is going to issue an edict. A law. And it's, the law is going to go like something like this. He's going to say, the first 666 people who are willing to become a part of the kingdom of God will live. All others will be put to death. What will that do? What will, such a, what will such an edict create? Well, it'll create two interesting outcomes. First of all, every, everyone who wishes to save himself will realize that he's got to join with the devil to live. And so those who are hesitant and not sure they're willing to worship the devil as almighty God... They're going to be a little bit, hmm, should I do that or should I not? Now, I know that, that that mark of the beast is 666. I know that's evil. Should I? Well, by the time they get their thoughts straightened out, they're in the one-third that's going to be killed. <laughs> you get the point? Those who have no compunction about worshiping the devil will rush forward and that's exactly what he wants because he wants no one in the kingdom of God, he's calling it that, the kingdom of God, who are reluctant, who are hesitant, who are not sure. That's how he separates them. And of course, he's going to kill the saints because they're all opposed to it anyway. So, here we go. He kills a third of mankind. That leaves 666. And so now, now you understand the Paul Harvey. This is what the scripture says. No one can buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And what is his number? 666. Those who receive the mark of the beast will hold out their right hand and receive a tattoo on their right hand showing the number 666. He forces everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. And yes, slavery will exist at that time. To receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. The lieutenant gets the mark on the gets the the name of the beast on his forehead the people in the 666 get the tattoo on their right hand and if you want to buy or sell show the mark the reason that the lieutenants or the captains of the group have the name written on their forehead 
is that it's imitating what God is going to do to the 144,000. Here in Revelation, talking about the 144,000, what does God do for them when he takes them to heaven? They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. The devil is just an imitator. He does the same thing with his captains. The mark of the beast is no big complicated thing. If you want to buy, do business, show your right hand. Right there. If you want to buy or sell, show me your right hand. You see a tattoo is low tech. You don't need a computer. You don't need electricity. You can put a tattoo on just like Hitler did in World War II very easily on your captives. Lucifer is going to tattoo his captives just like Hitler did. It's non-transferable, can't be lost, can't be duplicated. Identity theft, not a problem. <laughs> simple, simple, simple. And so, when Jesus appears at the second coming, there will be two groups of people. One group of people have the seal of God. They have hearts that have no sin in them. They have natures that are not attracted to sin or contaminated by sin or in any way corrupted by sin. And the other group of people will be tatted up. Or they'll be showing the indelible, unremovable mark and they're marked for destruction. They cannot escape. It was their choice. They chose not to put their faith in the Creator, but rather in the devil. In an effort to save themselves, they chose the path of least resistance. And it will cost them their life. Wow, powerful story, and I've raced through it at 100 miles an hour. But there's so much to this, and I, I cannot, in, 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 I hope to inspire you, and I can't encourage you enough to get busy understanding the story for yourself. It's huge, it's wonderful, it's life-changing, and it's exciting to know it's right around the corner. Please stand. Dear Lord, thank you for your precious word, which shines more brightly and more clearly than ever before. We see how the unsealing of the book of Daniel is changing everything we once thought. We're seeing how the prophecies connect the dots and reveal a plan that is interesting, magnificent, and wonderful. It describes a character, your character of love, like nothing else does. It makes the whole Bible come alive and practical and applicable and relevant to right now. Thank you for your precious, precious word. And we pray that the seed that has been sown here this weekend, that the truths that we have examined and that the things we have studied will take root in every heart and that someday there will be a large harvest as a result of the seed that's been sown. We pray and ask these things in your wonderful name, Jesus, a name above all other names. Amen.